were interrupted. The production chain was interrupted. Um, and so you had – there was some stuff that was very difficult to get at the store, and a lot of it was the most coveted stuff. And there was stuff that people, you know, scalping and all that. So you get to a situation where you owe money for bills that you can't get out of paying or you shouldn't put off. And maybe one partner in the relationship is more worried than the other, or um, one partner has uh, uh, an essential job and is better able to contribute, and the other is less able to contribute. And all of a sudden, they're dealing with a conflict that they can't just, you know, let slide or um, say, "Well, it'll work itself out." They've actually got to settle on something, and and, and are having difficulty. Um, couples that were previously maybe nonviolent in, uh, in their relationship may have discovered the point at which their relationship becomes violent if they don't have the tools to deal with a conflict situation where the resolution isn't easy. And, uh, what the Violence Against Women Act does that that contradicts the way you deal with this kind of violence um, and this kind of conflict management issue uh, is it it blames automatically the man, regardless of how the conflict progressed and began and everything, and it treats the situation as a patriarchal attack on all women and not just a conflict between the two individuals. Um, it doesn't provide any tools for teaching the couple uh, conflict management in a way that allows them to resolve their conflicts peacefully with each other uh, and and um, rely on each other and trust each other. Instead, it relies it, – its treatment process relies on separating them, punishing the man, and treating the woman as if she is forever broken and damaged because of what has happened to her. And that that her cover her recovery is dependent on developing the attitudes expressed in the philosophies behind its Duluth model, which again treats all violence in the home as a patriarchal attack on all women. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and well, I've said this is it's funny enough is that um, I have you know this is a guy I've gotten many feminists pissed off at me because I said this and I love doing that by the way. Yeah, it is kind of fun to piss them off. Yeah, but what I've said is, like, many feminists will point to Muslim countries and say, look how dependent women are in these Muslim countries, these poor women. And know what I, I know what I say to them that really gets them pissed off? What's that? I say that, you know, a poor woman in a Muslim country is actually less dependent than a Western woman, a poor Western woman in, the, in like, these countries. And they get angry at me, and they say, why? Well, I said, well, let's just think about it this logically. A poor woman in these Muslim countries, the only thing she has to do is get married to some man. And between when she gets married to this man, like the only people that are responsible for her well-being are her, I mean, her husband, their, her father, perhaps, and their brothers. Right. And so so what you're looking at, even assuming a big family, you have at most maybe eight people that are responsible for her. And in America, like America, for example, poor women are literally dependent on the entire male tax paying system. That's true. So let's think about it this way. You're comparing a situation where eight men have to take care of one woman. To another system where millions of men have to take care of one woman. That is true. And uh, and that is a way in which um, American women are far more dependent than, than Muslim women. Uh, the, other, the other issue about it is uh, American women don't have a tool for changing their situation <clears throat> because they have been – they've been robbed of accountability by uh, feminists. So, well, for I instance mean- – Oh, for instance, um, you know, I like I've I've talked about having made the wrong choice and uh, put my my family in a bad financial situation um, at uh, the age of 27, knowing that I was going to stay with uh, my husband forever. But having not married him yet, um, 
I failed at birth control exactly the way I described to women in the conversation that we've been in for the last two weeks. I failed to consider um, the requirements for maintaining the status, the effectiveness status of my birth control pills. And uh, so I, I screwed it up. And as a result, I got pregnant outside of wedlock and my family's financial situation was impacted severely by that. Um, and it took years of scrambling for me to mitigate the impact of that decision on my child, my stepchildren, my husband, my parents, um, and even my siblings because you know my brother and my sister-in-law um, had times when they needed financial help. And um, my parents uh, were helping both of us, so they had to limit what they could do for each of us. And uh, I, when I um, put us in that situation, it, it created a weakness in our family that when my job situation was suddenly yanked out from under me, we didn't have anything to fall back on. Mm -hmm. And as a result of my, you know, my initial wrong choice, um, financially inadvisable choice and everything, um, when I basically got um, done out of a job. Um, I, I was working as a professor for an adjunct professor for a, uh, a local university. Um, and there was a change in administration in the department where I was working. And the woman who changed, who took over the administration of that department was angry at the man who had been running the department prior. And so she fired everybody that she thought he hired and replaced them with other people. And I was on – I got on the cut list even though she had hired me because she forgot that she was the one who had hired me and not him. And uh, by the time I found out, um, I it was – I was supposed to be at work the next day. So I, I got 24 hours notice – or no, that day I got less than 24 hours notice that I was without this job all of a sudden. So we had to – we had to go on food stamps while I negotiated to go from part time to full time at another job. And uh, I, you know, I told the um, the lady that uh, I talked to at Job and Family Services, I'm like, I don't expect this to be a long term arrangement. I haven't got full time at my part time job yet, but I am negotiating for it. And I will let you know as soon as I get it, because I don't want this to be permanent. And she's like, well, that's not what the system is for. And it was like, are you kidding me? That's exactly what the system is for. It is for when you're temporarily down. It's not supposed to be a lifelong lifestyle. Oh, she got mad at me. Then she was going to not help me until she looked at my um, paperwork. And my family heritage uh, includes more than just white people. And uh, so when she saw that I had checked Native American on there as one of the races that make up my my family heritage um, – she uh, she changed her mind and decided that it was for people like me after all, and which really, really cheesed me off because I'm like, OK, so you want to trap people uh, you see as minorities in the welfare system forever. Uh, well, that that just made me more determined to get us out of it. And, and we did. We we got out of we we completely got off the welfare system. But what I learned being in that system um, and and working to get out of that system and not need it anymore was every time you take a step toward independence from the welfare system, the people who do the job of uh, maintaining the system and uh, maintaining a connection with the people who use the system, uh, they get threatened and they take actions to knock you back down. So if you if you have like if you work overtime or work the holidays at your job and you have one paycheck that goes higher than normal, um, they will write a letter to your employer demanding that the employer uh, respond to them with proof that that is not your new salary. And even if you don't draw a salary, you're an hourly person. Um, if you get a dollar above uh, a certain amount. They will yank hundreds of dollars in assistance uh, to to uh, punish you for making one dollar too much. And so what it does is it creates this gap 
this financial gap that you have to jump in order to get from unable to support yourself without public assistance to being able to support yourself without public assistance without losing that public assistance before you're able to support yourself. Yeah, and another problem with the welfare system is the government can never have all the information that it needs to assess how much money exactly to give everybody. Right. They ask for the same information. If they want to uh, penalize you or make it hard for you to use the system as it's meant to be used, they'll ask for the same information over and over again. Um, They will accuse you of not turning in information you turned in. Um, I actually had them deny that one of the receipts they gave me for information I turned in was real. Um, I had it right there. It was in their system. It was in my hand. You could see it. It had their uh, coding on it and everything that I didn't know anything about. And she's like, well, that can't be real because um, we don't have the information in the system that this receipt is for. Well, all that meant was that the caseworker didn't enter the information into the computer. It didn't mean it wasn't turned in. Um, You know, a common, like what I was talking about is where they don't have all the information to know exactly how much money to give everyone. It's also that what this always ends up in is you'll have people that really don't need the money as much getting more money. People that do actually need the money not getting enough. Yeah, and and then people who are, want to use the system um, as it was intended to be used, as in like, all right, shit has happened. I need some help for a few months while I get, you know, scramble to get a different job, get myself back on my feet again, uh, so my family doesn't end up homeless or starving because we don't have a nest egg to to rely on to fall back on. Right, we have no safety net. So this well, is supposed to be your safety net. Well, this safety net turns out to actually be like one of those traps where you're walking through the woods and you step on something and a net that was covered up by leaves, you know, snaps up around you and hangs you from the tree and you're stuck in it forever until something comes along and lets you out. Well, I mean, another thing that people don't take into consideration with things like social security, retirement funds and like that, the yeah. entire the entire point of them where it's all female purpose driven. Because, like, here's the thing, like, no one really back then expected the the idea of that men would start living a lot longer. And originally, what Social Security was a thing to help with was... was widows. In, yeah, for widows. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, in yes. retirement funds, well, those were also for, you know, for widows as well. Because, I mean, if you were a... So but let's say you're a veteran and you have a pension that goes into it. Um, well, if you've had your arm blown off, you suffer from PTSD, you have all these problems, it's most likely going to be the case that you're not going to be living that a lot longer. Yeah. So it's going to be more likely that the person that's spending the most money of the retirement money and the social security money is going to be women. Yeah, they they had not expected um, medical advancements that would uh, would make amputees with with uh, war trauma live as long as they do. Um, those systems are outdated, and we need to come up with a better way to uh, help. And I I think one of the things that's been clearly demonstrated by organizations like the Wounded Warrior Project is that. The government's not the best entity to handle these things. Uh, compassionate friends and neighbors and community members are. Um, and and it's, it's nice that we can pull together and create systems like that. Um, well, I- it's awful when the government steps in and says, well, we're going to take that system away from you and operate it ourselves. Because every time they do that, every time the government does that, it damages that system and uh, creates a a reduced quality version of it like what um people who hate walmart will point out that walmart does with regard to products you have to create a cheaper version of a product if you want walmart to carry it on their shelves Uh, and 
that does in a lot of instances create a lower quality product. So, uh, you know, this is, this is basically what the government does. They, um, less, less, they, they have less expertise. They have, uh, people who couldn't make it in, um, the private sector that doing jobs that, uh, are taken away from the private sector. And they have these systems that like the welfare system, the charity system predated it, um, that, that takes away the charity system and imposes the welfare system on people in, in, in a way that is inefficient and ineffective and uh, creates a an economic dependence almost equal to the reliance people end up with on heroin. Yeah, I mean, another thing that I've also, like, there was actually programs that were used by previously that, adri- that were sort of like a welfare system. I can't put my finger on it, but uh, I know that there was this um, sort of, I don't, it wasn't like a social security thing, but it was sort of like a group funded operation that black people originally would come up a mu- mutual aid society. That's what yes, called. mutual aid societies. Yeah. And you know, the government pretty much made them illegal. Yeah, and, the, the other thing that has disappeared, um, there used to be a, uh, you know, when you play Monopoly, Monopoly and you land on the community chest, I think a lot of people don't realize that was a real charity. And it was it was essentially like a mutual aid society. Um, the community chest collected donations and then distributed, like the Will Rogers Foundation, it distributed those donations to good causes. One of those good causes, um, there's an old Andy Hardy film um that was a promotion for the community chest uh, andy hardy if people don't know was a character played by um oh shoot why can't i think of the actor's name uh he was the guy in um in um like uh, uh, what seth rogan oh no much older than seth rogan um uh, betty white he was uh, he was the guy in um, the, the movie where Judy Garland played a kid who wanted to be a jockey. Yeah, I mean. Uh, anyway, um, but in any case, I don't but, understand why I can't think of his name right now. He's very famous, and like I've talked about this a gazillion times, but he did this promotion um, of of uh the community chest and i watched this video and it actually happened the first time i saw this video i was when i was pregnant with my son and it really pissed me off um that you know i'd been kind of because of my situation i ended up um you know getting having to decide between taking on the debt of um delivery and stuff or going on medicaid and there wasn't a third option there because uh, I could not get – nobody hires a woman who's already showing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I couldn't get insurance. And even if I did get insurance, it would not necessarily kick in. It, once you're already showing, you're only a few months away from going into labor. When you get a job, it takes months to get insurance and stuff to become eligible for that insurance. And uh, so yeah. I, I watched this um, – this this promotion uh for the community chest and discovered that one of the things the community chest donated to was an organization that helped women who had gotten pregnant out of wedlock um by giving them some education and helping with their medical bills uh giving them the opportunity to um earn the money to pay back the the medical bills and you know like a lot of them you know, it showed them becoming like secretaries and stuff like that. But at the same time, like that's a job. And I'm placing them with a job um, and giving them assistance with all of the various aspects of um, be- the difficulty of being a uh, an unwed mother. And like so that's an organization that kind of got destroyed by the welfare system people aren't going to donate to that because they're being taxed to pay for welfare and welfare does everything that 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 organization does except it 
doesn't. There's a welfare to work program, but it doesn't offer any of it. Like you don't get offered help getting a job. You just get ordered to get one. If they are going to train you for anything, it's being a cashier and and so on. So like the government took that over and does a shitty job. And I I thought, you know, if I was going to help somebody in my situation, I would want to do the best possible things to help them to make them independent after I gave them help. And if I wanted help in that situation, I would want the the best possible route to independence, not to be stuck with my hand out for the rest of my life going, hey, can you spare a dime? Can you spare another? Can you spare another? Mm-hmm. And what yeah. welfare does is it takes away the ability to do the former and puts you in a situation where the latter is your only choice unless you want to leap that gap. Yeah, and my personal thing that I really hate about all of it is that it's really a big like a bigotry of low expectations. Yeah. Which like for you know, I'm a guy that I have um I'm highly, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think I'm a high functioning autistic. My family knows that, they see it in me, they know it. And yeah. and you know what I remember what pissed me off very much. What like literally it made me raging mad was that I did something wrong. I I believe it was like, you know, I like I broke like I I like I believe that was that I I had done something stupid with the toilet. Like I think I put too much toilet paper in. Yeah. And it plugged up the entire toilet and we I had to pay some money to get it fixed. And that you know, my sister, she said, you have to understand, like, she was, because my brother-in-law was very angry at me, and he was saying, you know, you, we have to, you know, we know everyone's using this toilet, right? And uh, he got really angry at me, and my sister said, you know, you know, he, you know, he, you know, he's autistic. And I'm like, I got really angry at her for that. Yeah, because it's like that doesn't mean you can't understand these things and you can't learn from the experience. It, no, I said, it just, you know. I said personally, I said, no, I messed up. I am not using that as an excuse. Yeah. I, will, I will pay for it myself. Cause, this is something a lot of people don't understand. Because, yeah, I mean, well, people confuse an explanation with an excuse. Yeah. Well, and then the other thing is people confuse um, accountability with um, hatred and and um, aggression. And the thing about accountability is this. If you want to have success in life, uh, you you have to be able to take control of the things that you can control in order to make them go the way that you want them to go. And – to do that, you have to understand and exercise accountability, even when it's not fun. Because if you only exercise accountability when it's fun, um, you not, you miss not, out on opportunities to uh, change your situation as it is under your control and yeah. to improve your approach. So, uh, like getting good in video games, all right? That's an exercise of accountability. Where, you know, I, I had a friend growing up that any time um, his hand-eye coordination failed or um, he got to a point in the game that was faster than he was. Because we Atari games, a lot of them were just all hand-eye coordination testers, right? And um, direction of approach strategy testers and stuff like that, right? And any time he got to a point where the game progressed to a difficulty level that he had not yet developed the skill to overcome... He would get mad and say the game cheated and, you know, throw his controller and stuff like that. Um, And it took him a lot longer to improve in in games to the degree where he could, you know, get a higher score and, uh, you know, get a higher score than the other guys around him and everything. And the guys that would just like keep plugging and keep practicing and um, use failure as a a reason to keep trying and keep um, adjusting their gameplay would out you know outpace him quickly and uh it wasn't until he started to figure out that he had to do it the way they were doing it that he started 
improving his game skills faster. And, well, and doing that, doing that made a difference when he started job seeking and um, when he started working toward like I'm going to build a house, I'm I'm going to um, you know maintain a family and stuff like that. Um, then he 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 went through a series of bad relationships that he took responsibility for choosing women that were not ideal partners by a long shot and uh, medi- you know, not mitigated but altered his um, judgments of character and everything until he finally met a woman who was level-headed and um, kind and compassionate, loving and willing to be a partner and not just uh, a roommate that likes to have sex with you. And, um, and that, that is the marriage that he's in now. And he stayed with that woman. Uh, so it's like all of that, when you deny an entire gender accountability, the way feminists have women, you're actually cutting their legs off. Well, I mean, don't you know, Hannah, that what you're really saying is that if a woman gets raped, it's all her fault. Believe me, I've been told that enough. Um, and it's funny, too, because the feminists will say stuff like that. They will say one out of four women gets raped by the time they're out of college. They will know they are talking to a middle-aged woman. Uh, and um, well, if the pattern continues, they would expect that as a woman gets older, she has an even higher chance of being a recovered rape victim. Then they will also tell people that all rape, all rape victims are so traumatized that – Talking about rape to them is a uh, a trigger for panic, and you're abusive if you bring up rape to a rape victim without it being introduced into the conversation by that person first. And yet, consistently, they will bring up rape to women who are strangers to them, who are on the opposite side of an argument to their point of view, without knowing whether that woman is one of the, quote, one in four that they, they have claimed or not. And what people also don't really realize about the, I mean, I've always joked about this sort of logic. They say, you know, one out of four women have been raped, have been raped, have left college raped. And I said, so what you're saying is less women should go to college. Women would be better off if they did, if they went to to get an apprenticeship in the trades, and they say, weld. like on yeah. that. I said, well, that's what your argument would entail. Yeah, because I mean, let's think about it. If if I knew that there was a one in four chance that, let's say, I would get raped at a store, you, you can guess what I'm not going to be doing. Yeah, don't go shopping there. Go shopping someplace else. That's that. That's a bad place. <laughs> like, if, I, if I went to a place where I knew that there was a one in four chance of me getting raped, you know, at some point you'd have to think, you know, you're really asking for it. Well, it's it's not so much that it's. You know, all right, so you know this risk in, is involved. You cannot blame society for it. You, you still can blame the person who committed the crime. You can't be said to be asking for it. But you did put yourself in danger, and it's not somebody else's fault that you put yourself in danger. And other people are not responsible for the actions of the person that you made yourself vulnerable to. Um, only that person is responsible for his actions, and you're still responsible for your vulnerability. So that person is a criminal, um, and you know you should learn from the experience, and you have as much responsibility as you do right to protect yourself. Um, I mean, yeah, that's and just I, yeah, yeah. I, like, I will say this myself is like I'm a person that I was sexually abused in a me too with a, with a woman, and. You know, I will say that both, like, when it comes to men and women, both it's both bad, obviously. No one's denied. Oh, yeah. But I'm saying, I would say that this is something that's mad, that it's slightly worse for men. Because here's the thing, like, if for you, for example, the difference between me and you, Hannah, like, if you accuse just some random guy up the street of, of raping you, well, let's say you accused your teach, like your high school teacher, of raping you. Yeah, he becomes socially obligated to prove his innocence, and well, 
no, legally no. he's in serious trouble and no. and is not going to be offered due process. And I get all kinds of compassion for for that for that situation. Uh, yeah, yeah. My point was like, well, let's just see about this. Like, the difference is like this: is if you were to say accuse the, your teacher in high school of raping you, yeah. Uh, let's the the thing is like people might not believe you. But the reason why they don't believe you is not because they don't think it just is logically impossible to happen. They usually don't believe you because they think, oh, well, that teacher is a five-star teacher. They, you know, they babysit on their alone time. Like, and they have all these charitable acts that they do. So it's not that they're thinking, oh, well, it's logically impossible for this person, this man to have raped you. It's that I don't think that his moral character would allow him to do that. Yeah, uh, and in, and in actuality, most of the time, um, a person could have all those details, and the truth is, there'd still be people that would believe her. Yeah, but I mean, you know, but that's one but reason if they didn't. It, yeah, it wouldn't be because uh, she's female. And there are people who just assume you can't be raped because you're male. That is true. Yeah, and that's the difference. Is like because when a man, let's say, if a man got raped by his female teacher. You know, well, what people won't just say, you know, they won't just not believe him because, let's say, she's a five-star teacher. You know, she has all those same credentials as the male the male teacher does. They'll, they won't believe him for that reason as well, but they also won't believe him because they think that the idea of a man getting raped is like telling them one plus one equals three. Right. Well, there's other there's other things, too. Um Part of the reason that people differ in their beliefs about male and female victims is this. We have completely abandoned our recognition of female agency and male vulnerability in our society. So when you put those two things together, um, nothing a woman does that contributes to her vulnerability to a crime can be considered a factor in um, the not the cause of her crime, but the the lead up to the the crime happening to her. Uh, nothing because she has no agency. She's not allowed to be considered to have agency. And therefore, we can't even talk about ways that women can take control over their own risk level and yeah. provide I for themselves. Uh, control for themselves their level of safety but at the other end of it um, our society has completely abandoned compassion for men right so they don't they don't have compassion for a man's experience of being victimized he's not allowed to uh, be traumatized by anything that has been done to him to the degree that a woman might be traumatized by the same thing and then when you combine those things uh, the the agency and accountability factor with women and the compassion and consideration factor with men, a man's well, vulner vulnerability, if no. the person who did the traumatic thing to a man that he's not allowed to be traumatized by happens to be a woman who's not allowed to have the agency uh, to have impacted another person with her actions, our society has this hysterical blindness they cannot look at it because it is offensive to their sensibilities. The idea that a woman could damage uh, uh, and traumatize a man. And it is such a high level, such, a, such an ingrained and, and deep wound in our, our society's psyche that we inflict this on boys to the degree that a 40-year-old teacher can molest a 13-year-old boy and – he is treated as the aggressor in the relationship, as if it's a relationship, right? And it gets written about as a sexual relationship in the news media and not a rape. Yeah. I mean, the difference is, is if a 40-year-old man has sexual relations with, I mean, well, here's the common argument that they use. Well, the man had to have loved it. Yeah. And yeah. For, for one, that's not true. But two, even if it was true, that's irrelevant. I mean, if you pleasure a 10 to 13 year old kid and you're 40 years old, you've done still done numerous things wrong up to that. 
For one, you violated the trust of the parents that entrusted you with their child. Two, you violated your role as a teacher. And three, the child is not equipped to handle that at all. And it is damaging even if the child wants it. The same as it would be if the child said, well, I just want to eat 10 gallons of ice cream. If you gave the child 10 gallons of ice cream, it would be very damaging. The kid would get sick. Um, the kid might get fat. Uh, you know, the, the, the kid would definitely have some health problems as a result. There's going to be physical trauma. And the experience of that physical trauma is going to cause emotional trauma. So he wanted it is not an argument. Yeah. And I mean, no one would make that argument if it was the reverse where it like, and I mean, there is plenty of cases that you can point to where, let's say, where you have this male teacher, this like 40 year old male teacher and a 13 year old girl. And yeah. and literally there's text messages between the girl where the girl say, hey, I want to do this, this and this sexual act with you. And right. And people would still hold the 40 year old male properly accountable for being the adult in the situation. And rightly so. But I'm still saying that it's sort of bad that we don't hold the same standards for women. Yeah, exactly. And it, what's really sad to me, I, you look at this. So on behalf of women. In situations like this, feminists make the same arguments as pedophiles. Um, pedophiles will argue that children can consent to sex. And it's like I've had these arguments with with um, pedo acceptance advocates on Twitter for about 10 years now. Um, and yeah, they call themselves that. I do not accept that name. It does. It's not a valid name for them. They're not minor attracted people. All right. Yeah, it, They're. It, it, makes me think of Dora the Explorer and the map in a whole different light. They are vulnerable incompetence attracted people. And here's my explanation for why. All right. So people who call themselves minor attracted people will tell you they are not attracted to children because they're abusive. They're attracted to children because they're attracted to the child body type. Right. That's what they, they claim. Right. But the argument is blown out of the water. When you then ask them, all right, well, would you be satisfied with a relationship with a neotenous adult, an adult with an adult brain, an adult competence to consent and so on, whose body simply did not develop into uh, adult, an adult shape, an adult form, um, didn't grow body hair, looks childlike, like the disorder that Gary Coleman had that made him look like a child way into his adulthood um yeah. or some people just have this like my uh sister-in-law if she did not use the um accru accoutrements of female adulthood in her beauty routine very very carefully to make sure she uh she looked mature based on how she dressed and presented herself like if she just threw on a pair of sweatpants and, and a T-shirt and walked around like that without doing anything special with her hair to, you know, look like an older hairstylist. She looked like she was 12, clear up into her 40s. Um, yeah. And so, you know, my, my brother has always preferred her to be a little done up so she didn't look like a little kid because as deeply in love with her personality and her uh, adult female beauty as he as she he is, he, he, he likes her to look like an adult when she's with him. Um, it, it bothers him if she doesn't. Right. Uh, and, uh, I and, have and oh, a, a pedophile, a pedophile has uh, like, I've had them turn around and tell me, no, I would not be satisfied with an adult that can look like a child. It would have to be a real child or I would know the difference. So then I've asked, well, how would you know the difference? And their answer was very, very telling. They don't have that childhood innocence. They don't have they they know what they're doing. And my answer, of course, is you're not attracted to children. You're attracted to people who are uh, helpless subjects of your a in action on them, upon them, instead so of people who can engage equally with you in a relationship. Well, of course, I get blocked every time I, I uh, alert a pedophile to the fact that they are arguing um, for an ability to or for that their their attraction is to somebody who cannot consent to sex. Which is if that makes sense. So basically they can only have sex if it's right. Right. 
They can only have sex if the the they are they're the power person and the other person cannot tell them no and isn't isn't capable of understanding the situation. Well, I mean I had a remember I had a funny case where what's funny is is that this isn't just a sort of liberal feminist thing. I mean I've had very devoutly Christian conservative men make literally the same arguments that feminists do. Yeah. And it's a sort of a sad thing because I might agree with them on some politics and then they say something ridiculously stupid. And yeah. like example, like I had to respond to this one guy named David Wood who he was blaming Muslim men for basically leaving like from Afghanistan for leaving Afghanistan in alarming numbers. Um, you know, and just leaving the women there to be, you know, for the, the Taliban. You know what's really dumb about that? The women got out first. Yeah. Well, and you know what's well, well you know what's also stupid about that? I said, if you look up the numbers, you know who are the most likely people to be killed? Yeah, that's true. Men and boys. Women can, in a, in a wartime situation like that. Women can preserve their lives by aligning themselves with the enemy. Men, not so much. They are more likely to just get flat out killed. Um, And it's because the enemy doesn't necessarily trust men. And also the enemy doesn't feel um, as though they can overpower men as easily. Um, But in that that Afghanistan situation, there are two lies that happened in, in order to promote the idea that the men all left and left the women behind. The first one is they the um the um, American uh discussion of getting out happened for a few years prior to the exodus and women were sent away very quietly from Afghanistan over months and months prior to the actual exit. You know, people like sacrificed um, other parts of their family's economic welfare to send mothers and sisters and daughters out of Afghanistan ahead of the American abandonment of the country just in case, right? The other thing is um, the pictures that were used to claim that the uh, evacuation jets were full of just men and that there were no women. It turned out to be cropped images where if you took the entire image and not just the crop that they used to promote that idea, the majority of the people on those those jets were actually women and children, not men. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the fact that the men um, were there didn't make them uh, – didn't say anything about them abandoning women. Uh, the men were put in a part of the – the jet that was less comfortable because there was nothing to hold on to. And uh, the women were positioned where if there was turbulence or something, they would have something to grab on to, to stabilize themselves. So, you know, uh, around the edges of the, the jet and everything like this jet was just packed. It was a cargo jet. It didn't even have seats that, that you could see. So this jet was just packed with people and uh, the women were basically put in the safer positions. That's it. So it was a complete and total lie that the men abandoned the women and left them there to die. That well, just did not happen. Well, I also made the point that can you think of a single demographic other than men who are the most likely to be the ones killed who we asked to stay behind so they could get killed? Yeah, that is true. I mean, I we. Mean, let me, let's think about it this way. Let's say there was a situation where we knew a very, very dangerous mass serial killer was on the loose. And we knew he had an affinity for blonde haired women. Like that's, that's who he's specifically targeting. Would we think it's absurd to say that, Oh, blonde haired women should just be outside roaming the streets. So that way they don't get to the brunettes. Yeah, that is another, another very valid point in the situation. If it was true, if the the narrative that uh, the men left and uh, abandoned the women, um, it would still not be a valid argument against men, a valid demonization of men, simply because 
the women were more likely to be able to survive, whereas the men were more likely to be hauled out into the street and executed, and many were. Well, I mean, well, I mean, let's just think about it this way. They'll think, well, the men are obligated to stay behind and put up a fight. I'm saying you're really expecting one man to be able to take on people with military training, military budgets, and guns? Yeah. I mean, well, they wanted, they did everything they could to condemn men in the situation, but it's not just conservatives. Um, I heard that a lot from left wingers, and honestly. Um, they really had no business criticizing anybody that was getting out of Afghanistan because it was their president who put them in that situation in the first place. Yeah, and I mean, it's just, you know, I also just found it, you know, and the guy brought up a point where he was trying to compare it to Christianity and stuff like that, where he was trying to say that, well, take the Titanic, for example. It was clearly men were men were willing to stay behind and die so women and children could to get on the, the lifeboats. Yep, yep. And, and I said, for one, you're forgetting a couple key details. For one, even little boys got left behind. More little boys. Yep. And uh, so what's your excuse for them? And for one... Like, it's not like they were me- mentally capable of saying, you know what, I'm going to be altruistic and I'm going to stay behind so I can make sure my family is safe. Like, they weren't quite capable of doing that. No, and, they wouldn't have been able to consent to that. But uh, but he, no, he's right that it did happen and that's a longstanding um, standard. Well, the I mean, problem uh, is... Um, one more thing. Another yeah. thing that I don't... To tell you, it's not like that was a choice for many men either, because right. they were often forbidden from coming on the lifeboats, even right. if they. It's, so, I mean, you could have a situation where technically more percentage of men wanted to get on the lifeboats to and save they their life, and they couldn't. Yeah, so, the problem is we're deeming men's lives less valuable and women's lives more valuable. And men's experiences less meaningful and women's experiences more meaningful in holding that standard. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that it's a what I would call it's a vestigial instinct. Yeah, Um, it's sort of like the, the appendix in a way where, you know, once upon a time, it served a great function for like kids. Any society that any small tribal society that was not willing to sacrifice men to protect their women, they went extinct. Yeah, they got selected out. And that extinct instinct, um, that instinct lasted. I mean, it's it's still present in men today. And I, I, there's a weird situation I can describe that um, alerted me to that in a funny way. Uh, you know me and inappropriate jokes. Oh, yeah. So I, um, and you know me and allergies, I got this case of the hives in um, about 2007 that we never could figure out exactly what was the trigger for the hives. I just I, my whole body was covered in these huge, nasty, you know, red surrounded white welts that just I looked like a plague victim. But my face, don't you always when that have- happens, looks like I looked like somebody gave me a black eye and a fat lip. And, uh, uh, you know, a uh, crooked nose, like somebody beat the crap out of me or something. And wait, wait, wait Hannah, don't you always look like that? No. And <laughs> um, so I I had to call off from work and I had to go to the doctor and I had to go on steroids to to treat the uh, allergies and everything. And it was such a bizarre thing to call off for. I wanted my boss to know you know, this, I'm not making this up. This is what I look like. Nobody's going to look at me and then buy food from this store. If I'm the one that's preparing the food, they're going to assume they're going to get sick. And, uh, so I, I went in to take my doctor's note in, in person. Um, even though my, my husband at the, you know, at that time he was just like appalled at what was going on with me and he offered to take it in for me. And, uh, you know, it, it, cause his hives are different than mine. He gets these, he gets like, three times as many but they're all tiny and um to me they look itchier they look worse than mine but to him he was looking at mine that as you know being worse than his and and also he just takes care of me 
Um, I, like he's a sweetheart. But anyway, so he walked in there with me and he's behind me. And I was friends with the assistant manager. Um, and so I'm walking into the manager's office and the assistant manager's coming out and he looks at me. And he's in the middle of a sentence and, and interrupts himself in the middle of the sentence with, oh, my God, Hannah, what happened to you? And I just just off the cuff just joked, oh, I didn't get dinner to the table in time. And he's like, what? You know, now this guy, I'm bigger than him. Right. My husband is bigger than me by a lot. Like he's a big guy and well, not- he's very strong. Cool. And so this this um, assistant manager is uh you know he's not a fighter type he's not he's very gentle and normally and very very non-aggressive kind of person but in that moment he was gonna hulk out and attack a guy three times his size who literally i have video somewhere of it could bend steel with his bare hands he bent down the door frame, the window frame on a car door that was a car made in the 80s. So it was a steel car, not an aluminum car. Um, in, in one of those, you know, hit this car with a sledgehammer for however long for a dollar that he'd paid five dollars to beat the hell out of it. And uh, and I was like, I was kidding. I was kidding. <laughs> I didn't mean to get you mad. You know, everything's OK. It's just hives, you know, and this <laughs> His poor manager, but it was just like his instinct. Instantly, a, a woman in his sphere of existence, who was someone he was, he considered his friend, who we, he was protective of, um, looked hurt and blamed another man. Instantly, he was he was going to go on the attack, and it was total instinct. He was like, I don't even know what I was going to do, because like, look at me, and then look at him. What the hell was I thinking? And I was like, you know what? Actually, that's that's pretty normal. Yeah, and, you know, but Hannah, don't you know that there is a wage gap that's holding women? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, what I, I've always, I've actually made a critique that I don't think many people have actually made, because we've all heard the, you know, the obvious re- re- reply that this is just averages, this doesn't factor in, you mm. know, experience, um, how many vacations you take, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, It doesn't factor up, but another thing that the people don't think about is that I could imagine theoretically, because here's the thing, it's the problem of averages in general that any mathematician will tell you about, that you can have, if you have a a big enough gap between certain people, it won't actually matter how low the... I mean, let me just put, let me get, it'd be better to illustrate this. I could hypothetically imagine a world where, where women, like 99% of women are richer than 99% of men, but there still exists a wage gap where men are making slightly more money than women. You have to simply add one factor, very highly wealthy men. Yeah. If you Uh... have... Let's say if you were to have 10 trillionaires in this society and they just all happen to be men, it could be the case that 99% of women are richer than 99% of men, but because of the fact that the higher echelon men happen to be making so much more money than everyone else, when you average it out, it appears to look like that men are making more money than women. Yeah. Um, the other, the other aspect of a wage gap is you have to deal with the fact that, um, there is an, an acceptable lifestyle choice for women that to date is not widely acceptable for men. And that is, um, the choice to barely earn any money at all. If any money, and and um, basically rely on the income of a husband uh, or or even just go on welfare uh, and raise children in poverty um, rather than to uh, join the rat race and, and chase the almighty dollar in order to provide for one's family. I mean, so that. Know, yeah. 
that standard means that there is going to be a larger percentage of the female population at the bottom rung of the income scale who are not actually living in poverty, whereas when men are at the bottom rung of the in income scale, they generally are living in poverty. They're not relying on an income from a wife. And as a result of that, men have more incentive to make more money, and they are going to do that. So as long as, you know, as long as that standard remains in place, as long as we treat not earning any money as a, as a valid lifestyle choice for women all the time and rarely or never for men, we're always going to have a gap in earnings, um, in average earnings. Well, I mean, and it's I mean, not it's not sexism against women that causes that gap, and there is no need it's for our society to take measures to change that on behalf of women. I mean, it's like it's sort of like the, I've said the difference is like how you said it's the accountability gap that explains mm -hmm. it because. Mm -hmm. Because you have one party that is expected to believe that they have to die for the other, while the other party, working is just an, an option. It's a choice that they do. Exactly. So, and I mean, right, let's put this any other situation. Let's say it was reversed. Let's say women, let's say you had a bunch of just sort of like bum men who are just lazy, and women were expected to literally die for these men. And, you know, people would be saying, oh, well, look at the men. They're being so discriminated against. I'm like, uh, no, it's just like it's incentives. Exactly. So women who are, uh, you know, if you look at the wage gap the, with that understanding that, you know, there will be a segment of the female population that does not live in poverty despite earning not enough money or, or no money at all. Um, in terms of, you know, being able to not be in poverty, like they're still living a middle class life. They're just living it on their husband's income or they're still living an upper class life on their husband's income. Um, that's basically it discredits the idea that we have in our society a situation, an egregious situation that oppresses all female workers. And if you were to go through and you would look job for job and uh, hours for hours and so on that you would find that women are being discriminated against on, on pay um, at, on a wide scale where the same work and the same hours and the same experience and everything all exist. It's just not a factor. And well, I mean, yeah. And another thing is that people don't take into consideration is like, they'll say this is that like they'll often, I've heard feminists tell you this. Well, a man is just, afraid of a woman that makes more money than because he's afraid of a strong and independent woman i'm like no have you ever seen the divorce rates where the woman makes more money than the man yeah the well in any case what i wanted to say about it is because we we don't need to remedy the situation on behalf of women we're not remedying we're not remedying oppression of women in that situation if we take measures to eliminate the so-called wage gap we can't do so without deliberately disadvantaging men because there's not a disadvantage to women to be remedied. Uh, we have to create disadvantage in order to even out that number. If, and do you see what I mean? We can't well, do it without damaging and harming men. So well, I mean, when feminists argue that men are just afraid of a strong, independent woman, um, they're covering for the fact that they are afraid you will understand that they are arguing to actually take men's hazard pay, men's merit pay, men's shift differentials, um, men's incentive to do shitty jobs, uh, dirty jobs, dismal jobs, boring jobs and stuff like that in, in favor of paying women the same amount that men earn to do those jobs, the, those incentive pays. Um, so to to see that women are not left behind yeah. when women are actually choosing to stay behind. Yeah, and you know, like I've like I was saying before, also when it comes to the differences, is that 
like they'll say that a, a man is just strong is afraid of a strong independent woman i'm like you know that's stupid right because why would a man be afraid of a woman that can help him work less need to work less than he does yeah and two here's the thing it's not the, the divorce rate is not because men are scared of strong independent women it's because usually what happens is when men are making less money